Matthew chapter number 17. And uh, this is one of the passages of Scripture that I often refer to and use it for an illustration that I think uh, the best illustrations are the ones that God gives us in His Word. Yeah. He'll give us a promise, and then we can go and look at those. But there's so many things in the Word of God that we can use to illustrate the Word of God. And this is one of those passages that I refer to a lot, but I want us to look at it tonight and look at it in a somewhat closer detail and see how the Lord can apply it to our own lives as we desire to be drawn close to Him. I realize in life that a lot of times there's places that are good places and there's places that are not bad are not good places and we try to stay away from but when it comes down to it that uh, the things that mark what a place whether it's good or bad that many times is uh, is uh, how the Lord would view it or how that it could uh, apply to us either help us or hinder us spiritually but there's some um, times and thank the Lord for, and I praise the Lord tonight for the opportunities we have to come to his house and to gather in his presence as a church body and as church family and I'm thankful that the Lord shows up and meets with us and helps us and and I'd say this is one of those good places that we have this is where we can come and get a fresh drink of water but I'm also thankful for those private places that we have of study and prayer and devotion and uh, there's times that maybe we're in our vehicle and we're driving down the road and we're listening to preaching or a gospel CD or just simply meditating on the goodness of the Lord and uh, he shows up with us. Yeah. And, buddy, that's a good place to be. Yeah. Anywhere the Lord is and we're with him and we're close to him is a good place. And yeah. uh, we find that Peter, James, and John, they, they end up in a good place. As a matter of fact, Peter, uh, he says it's good for us to be here. But let's all stand together tonight and let's look in chapter number 17 of the book of Matthew. And I'll share with you a few thoughts out of these verses. Verse number one, the word of God says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses, one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be raised again from the dead. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful tonight, Lord, that you've given us the privilege to be able to come together around your word. And Lord, I'm thankful that you always are mindful of what we are going through in our lives and what we're going to face tomorrow. And Lord, we're thankful for your faithfulness of what you've brought us through. And Lord, I just pray tonight, Lord, that you'd help us to be as close to you. Lord, I pray that I know if we draw nigh unto you that you'll draw nigh unto us. But Lord, let this year be a year of every day, be a day of spiritual growth in our lives. And Lord, let us get so close to you, Lord, that we can... Feel your breath upon us, and Lord, we can acknowledge your presence, and Lord, feel that touch and your nearness, and Lord, we know that you're with us, and we know you'll never leave us nor forsake us, but Lord, how wonderful it is whenever, Lord, it's so real in our lives. Lord, I pray that we would ever be disciples, Lord, learning from your word and learning from you, and Lord, uh, to go out into the highways and hedges and proclaim the greatest news that there is uh, to share. Lord, I pray tonight that you'd Help us, Lord, to be men and women of God. Lord, that you'd grow us strong for your glory and for your grace. We ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, we know tonight that when we think about um, our uh, Lord, whenever you go sometime in your Bible to the book of John, chapter number 17, and you'll have a, a conversation of Jesus' uh, a high and holy priestly prayer, and 
he's communing with the Father, and he's uh, sharing some things in his heart. And many times throughout the years, we've heard people refer to the model prayers, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, whenever the disciples said, uh, Lord, teach us to pray, and the Lord said, after this manner, pray ye therefore. But that's really not the Lord's Prayer. The Lord didn't have to ask for uh, sins to be forgiven. He didn't need to ask for uh, daily provisions, that he's the Lord. But what he was doing was giving instructions. That's the model prayer. But the Lord's Prayer is found in John chapter number 17. Now, in that prayer, on several occasions, the Lord spoke about his glory being restored unto him, uh, as that he had with the Father before the world was. Now, I want to say this, that thank God Jesus didn't originate in Bethlehem's manger, uh, that he always has been and always uh, is and always will be. And there never was a time that he was not and there never be a time that he'll cease to be. Uh, he wasn't voted in and thank God he'll never be voted out. He's the great I am, not the great I was, but he is the great I am. Now, we know that uh, he was uh, there and before creation, that he's been there through eternity past, that in the beginning God, uh, Elohim, the pluralistic name for God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But we do know this, that when Jesus uh, left the splendor of heaven, uh, that uh, he said uh, that the word of God spoke in Philippians chapter number 2 about how he humbled himself and uh, the steps of uh, humiliation. And one of the greatest steps of humiliations whenever he took and he robed himself in human flesh and identified with sinful man and became obedient unto death, even unto the death of the cross, uh, which um, was a terrible way to die, an excruciating and a humiliating type of death. But what I want to say tonight is we know as Bible believers uh, that uh, the Lord Jesus never, ever, ever set aside his deity. When he came, he was just as much God as he always had been. Uh, he was 100% God, 100% man, not 50-50, but 100% uh, both uh, ways, humanity and deity. But what he did do was he set aside his glory. Uh, if he'd have came in all his glory, if he'd have been radiating in his glory, first of all, I don't believe man could have ever looked upon him uh, in our sinful condition because we couldn't handle it. Uh, but second of all, had he come in his glory, uh, that that's what they were looking for. And they would have crowned him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and they would have bowed the knee, and they would have confessed with their tongue, and uh, there wouldn't have been any Calvary, and had there not been any Calvary, there wouldn't be any redemption, and we would all have been in hell, and there's not anything we could do about it, but there had to be a cross before there could ever be a crown. And so he set aside that, uh, that glory. And now we find in, in Matthew chapter number 17, you can also read about it in John chapter uh, number, uh, or Luke chapter number 9 and a few other passages of scripture. Uh, but uh, there's a, a time when Peter, James, and John got to get just a, a little glimpse of what Jesus is going to be like whenever we see him uh, in heaven. Now, I don't know tonight, it's just my opinion, but I do believe that he is going to bear in his body the marks of Calvary. Amen. And the reason I believe that is because after his resurrection, when he appeared to the disciples, uh, that uh, Thomas said, except I see the print in his hand and, and, and all this. And Jesus had that. And then we read over in the book of Revelation, whenever they're looking for somebody who's worthy to open up the books. And they looked and there's one as a, a, a lamb that had been slain from the foundation of the world. And I believe he'll bear the marks of his body, the marks of Calvary to be a constant reminder that every time you and I look at those marks, it'll be a, a testimony to how much he loved us. Now, when I think about this tonight, that I'm thankful that in heaven we won't need no sun because Jesus is going to be the light of that city and he's going to be radiating in all of his glory. But when we look here, we're thinking to, tonight that these men were privileged to be able to see a little bit of what you and I are going to see a whole lot of whenever we get to heaven. Now, to help you understand a little bit about what's going on here, if you notice in chapter 17, verse number 1, that the very first word that we see is and. Now, what that tells me tonight is this is a continuation of something that's already been going on. And so for me to understand what's going on here, I've got to put it in reverse and back up a little bit and find out what's been happening previously to this. And so I want to rewind for just a moment back to chapter number 16 and look, if you will, in verse number 21. Verse 21 says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem. Notice that word must. He must go unto Jerusalem. 
Why is he going there? Here's what's going to happen. And suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now, all the time he's preparing these disciples, but yet uh, it's not able really to sink in. And he's told them what's going to happen. And he's told them what's going to happen. And he's told them what's going to happen. And he's preparing them for tomorrow, but yet it's not actually sinking in. I wonder how many times the Lord has to constantly remind us over and over and over again and reiterate his promises and his truth over and over again, but yet sometimes we, like the disciples, it just don't really sink in. I'll tell you this, if God's word ever really registered with us, we wouldn't spend any more time worrying about things. If God's word ever, ever really, really registered with us, we wouldn't go around dragging our tails and, and dragging our lips and, and feeling defeated and discouraged. We'd be proclaiming uh, that, thank God, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. And we'd be out here running around shouting and testifying of his glory and grace. But uh, what happens is we let the realities of life sometimes overshadow the promises of God. It should never be that way, but yet we find it's true. Now, what happens here, we read, and the Word of God tells us uh, that after he shared these truths, uh, that he's going to go to Calvary, and he's going to die, and he's going to be resurrected. And verse 22 says, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Now, I understand where Peter's coming from. Peter didn't want to accept this truth. Peter didn't want to think anything possibly could happen to uh, his Lord, and I understand that. But he took him, and the idea was that he laid hold on him. And he said, uh, Lord, it's not going to be, and rebuked him. Can you imagine Peter rebuking the Lord and saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. You know what he's doing? He's arguing with the Word of God. Now, I know it's an innocent context, but still yet, it's still wrong in the fact that this is what God said, and Peter said, no, it's not going to happen like that. Can I tell you, no matter what context it is, that you and I never, ever, ever have the privilege or the authority to ever question or to cause a question to be raised in regards to what God said. If God said this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to happen. If God said this is right, then that's what's right. If God said this is wrong, then that's what's wrong. Uh, what we need to do tonight is take God's word at face value. But really what Peter's saying, Peter said, Lord, I know what you're saying, but I just have a hard time accepting it. Yeah. Did you know there's a lot of things in God's word I have a hard time accepting? Yeah. Uh, there's times God deals with my heart and begins to show me uh, how unworthy I am and, and how low I am. And, and God's Word, I'll tell you what it'll do. It'll tear you up one side and down the other. And sometimes I have a hard time accepting that. But if I ever really come to the place and say, Lord, you're always right and I accept it and I fall at His feet for mercy and grace, I tell you, I end up coming out a whole lot better. Right. But when I look here, I see this and... And he's rebuked by Peter, and the Lord goes on and tells him that he's going to die, but he is going to be resurrected, and, and goes on and, and speaks about his coming kingdom uh, until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, verse number 28. And so he's sharing some things. He said, it's going to happen this way, but it's going to end this way. And rather than looking at how it's going to end, they were looking at how it's going to be. And I'll tell you tonight that we need to be, rather than looking at how it is and how it's going to be in the next few months or days or weeks, we need to look out into eternity and how God said it's going to end and we ought to praise his name because uh, thank God I know how it finishes and we're not on uh, the winning side but we're on the side that has already been declared victory and I tell you I praise his holy name tonight for his truth. Now as we look at this we find that there's a little glimpse of what's going to happen here in regards to the Lord's glory. Now when we go to verse number 17 it says and after six days that there's some things happen that the Lord takes Peter and James and John into a high mountain, and the Word of God says he's transfigured in their presence. Now, these men got to see a little bit of what you and I are going to see a whole lot of in one day, and, and uh, thank the Lord. But what I'm saying tonight is they got to experience something that was real in their lives. 
they got to experience something that I'll guarantee you that these men never, ever, ever got over. And the reason I say that is because how could you get over something like this? And secondly, when we read about Peter and back in Second Peter, and Peter makes reference to this. Why? Because he said, listen, we've witnessed a lot of things. And he said, and he goes and recounts what happened. Can I say that I, I never witnessed anything like this? But thank God he's let me experience some things in my life that I've never got over that has changed my life. And thank God I can go back to it and I can go back to it and I can go back to it. And I got a call last night and it was a young man and he was all tore up and he was upset and there's all kind of things in his life happening. And he said, it seems like everybody's life is just moving so smoothly and everything's going so good for everybody and they're skating through. And here I am. And I said, brother, I said, I know what it looks like. I said, but I'm here to tell you that those people that you see with a smile on their face and, and they're telling you that everything's all right and it's good. I said, they got their problems just like you got your problems. I said, the only difference is, is what we do with our problems. If we try to carry them, it's going to wear us down and wear us out. I said, but we're to cast all of our care upon him, for he careth for us. And I said, we got to come to a place where we trust him by faith. And he starts talking about some things that the Lord had done in the past. And I said, that's exactly what you need to do is look back at God's faithfulness and be reminded that God's the same God he was then. And God hadn't changed. And what God did back then, God's going to do today. And I said, you don't know how and you don't know when. I said, but I promise you that God has already got it worked out if you'll simply just trust him by faith. I said, so rather than being upset about it, I said, why don't you hang up the phone and just thank God in advance? Now, I was talking to him, but I was really talking to me at the same time. Why? Because I sounded real spiritual on the phone last night, but I'm be honest with you, I haven't arrived. But thank God, I'm closer than I was by the grace of the Lord. But he's still helping me. But I'll tell you, if these things would ever really register with us, we'd have no reason to go around uh, uh, complaining and murmuring all this. i got to hurry. We ain't going to get through this. Now, notice what happens here is we find in verse number four, when the Lord was transfigured, Peter said, unto them said Jesus or unto the Lord he said Jesus he said Lord it is good for us to be here I tell you life is filled with mountaintops it's also filled with valleys and everything in between and sometimes we say it's good to be on a mountaintop but can I tell you this it's also good to be in the valley why? Because the Lord has a purpose for every place in life that he has for us. The Apostle Paul, he talked about how that he had went through some things and he knew how he had to learn how to be a base and he also learned how to abound. But God's faithful in it all. Now notice right quick in verses 1 and 2 that I believe Peter was excited and he was happy about being here in this place and I'll tell you why, it's because he got to examine, he got to see, he got to witness, he got to experience the Lord and his glory. And any time you get to get a little glimpse of God's glory, it's a good place to be in. Whenever I look here in verse number one, the Bible tells us uh, that the Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. Now, it would appear that these men are part of a, a little inner circle. Uh, they're kind of like uh, the core. Uh, they're, uh, they're a group of men that's been separated and they've been uh, uh, experiencing a, a certain privilege that the others didn't get to experience. Now, this is not the only time that we find them uh, being isolated and separated from the rest of the men and the Lord taking them and letting them experience something. If you go back to whenever uh, Jesus raised a Jairus daughter from the dead, Peter, James, and John got to witness that. Yeah. Well, wouldn't that have been wonderful? And I thought about whenever uh, the Lord, uh, he went into Gethsemane and uh, the Bible said he went a little deeper, went a little further, that Peter, James, and John was there and they got to witness some things. And I look at this and people say, well, uh, what was so special about Peter, James, and John? Can I tell you, we know what the Word of God says. And the Word of God says that our Lord is no respecter of a person. You know what that tells me tonight? It tells me that the Lord doesn't love one person more than he loves another. It tells me tonight that he doesn't favor one more than he favors another. That God's love is enough for all of us and God's favor. But we do know tonight that it is a fact that there's some people closer to the Lord than others are. And you know why that's true? It's because that's what they have desired. It's because that's what they have wanted. It's because that's what they have uh, sought after. Because James said that if we'll draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh to us. 
I'm going to tell you tonight, you and I can be as close to the Lord as we desire to be. When I thought about this, uh, I, I said, I want to be like John. You know why? Because when I find John, John, he refers to himself as the beloved disciple. Or he says, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Many times when he uses that term, uh, whenever uh, we read the account of uh, they were at the Last Supper, and the men were assembled together with our Lord. And uh, John, the Word of God said, the disciple whom Jesus loved was leaning on Jesus' bosom. Yeah. And you know what that means? It means he was in a place of special closeness. He was actually leaning over on our Lord. Now, I'll tell you, that's a place of closeness. Yeah. In a literal sense, he could actually feel the breath of God when he would breathe on him. I don't know about you tonight, but in a spiritual sense, I want to be able to feel God's breath upon uh, my life and upon this church and upon you and your family. Uh, he was there whenever the Lord spoke. The Lord didn't have to holler it out. And the Lord didn't have to repeat himself. All he had to do is just say with a still, small voice. Boy, John heard it. Why? Because he's right there. He could feel the Lord's heart whenever it beat. He could feel that closeness. And what's interesting is the Lord announced something that would, uh, would shake these men. He said, there's one of you here that's going to betray me. And all of a sudden they started asking the question, is it I? Is it I? You know why? Because deep down inside they knew each one of them could be capable of something like this. Is it I? Is it me, Lord? Peter said, Lord. Or Peter looked at John and said, John, ask him who it is. You know what John did? John probably just looked up. And he didn't say, Lord, is it me? He said, Lord, who is it? Yeah. You know why? Because he knew it wasn't him. Yeah. I'm going to tell you this. You get close to God and you'll know there's some things that we're going to be excluded from. Yeah, yeah. And thank God tonight. And there's some things he's going to let us in on. And it's not because he favors one more than the other. Surely he loved all the disciples. But John said, I'm the beloved disciple. I'm the disciple who Jesus loved. Not that he was boasting and saying he loves me more, but he's saying this, there's no doubt in my mind he loves me. And can I tell you tonight, I want to say thank God there's no doubt in my mind that he loves me. And I say praise his holy name for that. Amen. Uh, we find here that this is a special place. The Bible says that they went up into a high mountain. It went way up there. When you read over in 2 Peter, and uh, you don't have to turn, but let me read these verses. Peter is uh, uh, recounting some things. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, he says, For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the uh, excellence, uh, excellent glory, he's speaking about this account we're reading about in Matthew. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then Peter says, And, and this voice which came from heaven we heard, uh, when we were with him in the holy mount. You know what Peter's saying? Peter said not only was we up in a high mount, but this was a holy mount. And what made it holy tonight, by the way, the high places with God are holy places with God. And uh, the reason it was a holy place is because that's where the Lord was. Amen. Amen. Now, I, I can understand why Peter wanted to stay up there, can't you? Sure. Yeah. Nobody wants to leave a service like that. But you know what happened is they had to leave the mount. And they had to come off the mountain back to the valley. And when they got back to the valley, you know what happened? Is the reality of life sure. began to set in. Sure. First thing happened is they uh, had to face a demonic spirit. And, and then we read about there was an issue of, of paying taxes and all this. And got down back to where the rubber meets the road. Uh, you and I can relate to that. We can come to the house of God and, and get caught up in God's word and his love for us and fellowship. And buddy, we're so excited we can't hardly stand it. And we get back home and uh, on Monday morning and all of a sudden things get back to real life. And this is happening and that's happening. And it's real easy sometimes for us to let the things of life rob us of what God's done. And I tell you this, you and I can't live on the mountain forever. But even though they might have had to go back down in the valley, they carried this mountaintop experience in their heart. And I don't think they ever got over it. And what I'm saying this morning uh, or this evening is here's the point. If you're saved and you know Jesus, thank God there's going to be times that uh, you're going to experience uh, uh, his glory. And there's going to be times you're going to experience his nearness. And there's going to be times that he chooses to manifest himself. And whenever he does, you and I ought to take every opportunity that we have to get our spiritual batteries charged to the very fullest we can get them charged. 
And you say, why? Because when things get rough, thank God it will carry us through. Yeah. The special times will carry you through. The Bible says that the Lord Jesus was transfigured. And the word transfigured in verse number 2 comes from a Greek word. Uh, it also means metaphor, metamorphosis, which has the idea of changing uh, form or changing appearance. Uh, you and I can relate to a caterpillar that uh, uh, changes into a beautiful butterfly. Uh, but up until that day, they saw, the Jesus, or they saw Jesus as being unique and extraordinary. But when they looked at him, he appeared to be just like any other Jew of that day. By the way, do you know, of all the pictures and paintings I've ever seen rendered of what people think Jesus looks like, I've never seen one that looked like a Jew. No. One of these days we'll know what he looks like. Amen. Amen. said a little girl was in class one day and she was drawing a picture and a teacher come up to her and she said, Honey, what are you doing? And she said, I'm drawing God. And she said, Well, that's sweet. She said, But... Nobody knows what God looks like. And she said, they will when I get done. <laughs> Amen. One of these days, we're going to know what he looks like. But whenever I think about this, got a glimpse of his glory. Do you know, Moses got real discouraged on one occasion. And Moses said, Lord, show me thy glory. The Lord told Moses that there's a place down in the rock. And he said, down the cleft of the rock, he said, go hide yourself in there. He said, I'm going to pass by. He said, I'm going to let you get a little glimpse of my hinder parts. You can't look on me, but I'm going to let you get a little glimpse. Moses got down there. The Lord passed by. And boy, I tell you this, Moses, he didn't even realize it. But he, everything about Moses changed. Yeah. When he came off the mountain, his face was shining to the point where people were afraid to even get around him. They wanted to put a veil on. Why? Because he had been in the presence of God. Can I tell you this? When you and I are in the presence of God, we don't have to go around broadcasting it. It'll tell on us. I, it'll show up on us. And people will know that they, they, they don't just talk it. They know who God is, that he's real in their lives. And, and I've never got to see him like uh, Moses did in the cleft of the rock. I haven't got to see him like uh, Peter, James, and John. I haven't ever heard an audible voice like uh, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Elijah, some of them. I wasn't there when the Shekinah glory came down on the Holy of Holies. But I will tell you this, thank God there's times in my life and he's made himself known. And there's no way I could ever deny who he is. And he's warmed my heart and he's done things in my life. And he's moved through these services. I'll tell you, I praise God tonight. I know we, we don't go by feelings, but I'm glad, thank God, I got something so real that from time to time I can feel it. Amen. We go by facts, but I'll tell you this, he's real. Nobody ever, ever, ever convinced me he's not. Why? Because he's walked with me and talked with me. We find here uh, that uh, uh, there, there's uh, something happens when you look in verse number three. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. There were some heavenly visitors showed up. Now, there's a lot of lessons could be said here. But one thing I want to share with you is think about this. Moses has been dead for over 1,500 years. They buried him a long time ago. But now we see Moses. They see Moses. And they can't deny what they're seeing. And Moses is up. He's moving around. And he's talking. And he's recognizable. And what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying 1,500 years after they said goodbye to him, that thank God he's still alive. Uh, you know why? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Don't ever, uh, ever think uh, that whenever somebody lays your body down in the grave that you're going to stay there until... We went to a funeral service, and I don't even know what kind of funeral it was. It was for a family member, and whoever was doing the service, I don't even know what kind of title, how to dress, but they talked about uh, the loved one and how that they were going to sleep in the grave and be in the grave until the Lord came back, and then he'd bring them out of that sleep, and I said, uh, praise God, thank the Lord. <laughs> the word sleep in Jesus has the idea of having that rest in him, and I'm not going to be sleeping in some old grave. I'm claustrophobic. If I thought I was going to be in the grave, I'd go all to pieces right now, but thank God whenever I take my last breath here, my next breath is going to be in his presence. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and with him, uh, what God bring with him is what the book tells us over in First Thessalonians chapter number 4, that God's going to bring back with him yeah. who those that have gone on before. Yeah. He don't have to call them up out of no grave. Right. No, sir. They already in his presence. Thank God. You want to know where your loved ones are that's been saved by his grace? 
They're in the presence of Almighty God. Uh, we find that, uh, that uh, Moses, he represents those who have died in faith. And we find Elijah represents those that was carried up into heaven. He remember the chariot of fire came and picked him up and took him home. And he represents those that will bypass death. My pastor, um, uh, for years and years and years and years, he wouldn't buy a grave plot. He said, I, I, I plan on going by the, the rapture. But then when it got near, the life got near the end and, and Miss Lockie went home to be with the Lord, my pastor, that he got a plot beside her to be buried. He said, but still yet. He said, I'm still looking for the Lord to come. Yes. You and I, as you know, you and I tonight, we might not ever see death. Right. Amen. We could bypass it all together, and it wouldn't bother me one bit if we did. Amen. Amen. Uh, we find, uh, by the way, when you go to Luke chapter number 9, uh, that word of God tells us that Moses and Elijah was talking with Jesus about his decease. The word deceased means exodus. And it has the idea that Jesus was talking to them about how he was going to be leaving this earthly life behind. He was telling them that he was going to go back to be with the Father and sharing these truths. Can you imagine what the conversation must have been like? I'd have liked to have been a fly on the wall and heard that one, wouldn't you? But, you know, think about tonight. Moses represented the law. Did you know the law pointed to Jesus Christ? All the sacrifices... All the blood that was shed, everything pointed to Jesus Christ, the dear Lamb of God that would come and shed His blood, a one, a one sacrifice for sin forever. And we find that Elijah, that he represents the prophets uh, uh, whenever they preached and they proclaimed and they prophesied about the Lord coming, uh, that uh, His coming and death. And, and they're here to exalt the Lord's greatness. And uh, here's a testimony. And uh, when you, you don't read it here, but if you go back to the book of Luke, and you read, you'll find that uh, these, uh, these disciples, Peter, James, and John, the Bible says that they were under a heavy sleep. They were asleep, and whenever they woke up, that's when they saw Jesus transfigured. That's whenever they saw the Word of God says that he, His face did shine as the sun, and His raiment was white as the light. That's when they saw Moses and Elijah uh, talking with them. And I can imagine, buddy, they jumped up out of sleep. And uh, they're looking and they're observing and they're trying to take it in. And Peter, you know how Peter is. Peter couldn't stand it. He just had to say something. One of my college professors said the only time Peter ever opened his mouth was to change feet. He always had a foot in his mouth. But he did. And notice... By the way, some of us have the same problem. Amen. We talk when we ought to be quiet, and we're quiet when we ought to be talking. But we find that what Peter says on the surface, he spoke up, and what he said don't seem to be uh, anything harmful in it. Uh, but Peter said, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles. That's kind of like these tents. One for these, talking about the Lord. One for Moses. One for Elias. He said, let's make three tents, and let's keep this experience like it is from now on. I don't ever want to come off this mountain. Now, that sounds like a good thing, but the problem was that whenever Peter wanted to build these three tents, he's putting Moses and Elijah, which is Elias here, and Jesus on the same level. And I'm here to tell you tonight, nobody or nothing is worthy to be put on the same level as Jesus. He's above all, and he's in all, and he's over all, and he alone is worthy of praise and glory and majesty and, and all that, and he alone. And, and whenever Peter said this, all of a sudden there was a, a, a seventh one that showed up, and it was a, a God from heaven, the Father, and the Word of God said in verse number 5, while he yet spake, while Peter is speaking these words, while he yet spake, Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Do you know the Father spoke when Jesus was baptized? He said, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. He spoke and said the same thing right here. And we don't have no record of it. But I wonder when, J when Jesus gave his life on Calvary and he took that blood and he put it on the mercy seat. If the father didn't say, this is my yeah. beloved son. Amen. 
in whom I am well pleased. You know why he was pleased with the son? It's because the son had one desire, and that was to fulfill the will of the father. I'm going to tell you tonight, if you and I want the father to be pleased with us, we need to be about his business and be about his will. Notice this last thing right quick. Whenever they heard the voice from heaven, uh, the disciples, verse number six, when they heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. Well, I can imagine. I don't know what this voice would have sound like, but I can imagine. They were and in verse number seven, and Jesus came and touched them. He came over and touched them. You know what happened? They fell down. You know why they fell down? Because they fell down in fear. Jesus knew they were fearful. He didn't rebuke them. He didn't correct them. He didn't scold them. He just simply walked over and he touched them. I'm going to tell you, thank God for his touch. I say praise God for the master's touch. No wonder Peter's talking about this a good place that he got to see the Lord's glory and and uh, and this touch of the Lord upon uh, upon them and and I'll tell you this uh, for those that might be consumed with worry and fear uh, you let God show up or let God pass by and let God touch your life and I'll tell you what it'll do it'll drive that fear and worry plumb out the door. For those that may have never experienced the Lord Jesus and salvation and are consumed with anxiety and fear and all this, I'll tell you what, you come to Jesus by faith and call upon his name and let him save your soul and put a a touch on your life. And I'll tell you, uh, he'll give you a peace that passeth all understanding. When I look at this, and when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. You know what happened this little wonderful experience only lasted for a brief time they look up and Moses is gone they look up and Elijah's gone there's no longer any voice coming from the shadow above them in the clouds but Jesus is still there he's still there can I tell you this they still had his presence regardless of what changes in our life and what changes in this year what changes in this world I can promise you that Jesus is still going to be there. He's still going to be there. He's going to be right there. I praise his name. We find that uh, the word of God tells us that uh, Jesus, he came, they came down off the mountain. Jesus charged them saying, tell the vision to no man until the son of man be risen again from the dead. When I look at this and I hear Peter, what he says over in second Peter, I thought about these men carried this experience in their heart every single day. And no matter what anybody said about their Lord, they knew what they had seen and they knew what they witnessed and they knew what they experienced. And nobody could ever take that away from them. Can I tell you, regardless of what this world is saying or not saying about our Lord, nobody can ever take from me what I have in my heart. And I bless his holy name. Aren't you glad you saved tonight? Boy, I praise his holy name. I'm going to tell you, they was in a good place, but I'm going to tell you this, we're in a good place right now. Amen. Thank the Lord for his presence and thank him for helping us. We're going to stop here and we're going to take some prayer requests.